Good morning, everyone. This is Colin with Buckley. Uh, we'll just give this a couple more minutes, maybe two or three more minutes. Uh, we still got some people rolling in and we'll get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin D, and I'm a member of the engineering and marketing team here at Buckley. Uh, before we get started today, I just wanna say a few quick words. To start, thank you to everyone participating today and for taking some time out of your day to spend some time with us. Uh, it means a lot to us here at Buckley as a lot of time and effort goes into the planning of these webinars. Uh, we are so happy that you all see a value in the services that we're providing to the engineering community here in New England. Uh, today, Price Industries has put together a presentation to review some of the general HVAC design considerations specifically related to COVID applications. Now, the, the topics that are going to be discussed today are ones that the entire engineering team here at Buckley is trained on. We deal with these applications every single day, so no matter who your contact is here at Buckley, please feel free to reach out to us at any time, no matter if it is related to the topics discussed today or any of our other Buckley products. Uh, we have quite a few people registered today, so what we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna start off with everybody muted, or feel free to mute yourself. However, please feel free to use the chat function to interrupt and ask questions as we move along. Uh, we'll be sure to monitor any uh, questions that pop up and we'll do our best to answer them directly. Uh, now that we're ready to get going, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and hand the presentation off to the Price Industries team. Uh, who's over there? Krista, is that you? Can you uh, can you hear me, hopefully? Sure can. There you go. I'll hand it off to you guys. All right. Thanks, Colin. Um, just some administrative items before we get started. Um, there is one PDH available for um, this presentation that's taking place today. Anybody who has signed in and has attended this presentation, uh, you will get your PDH credit, I'm um, thinking, by the end of the day. Um, so if you don't get it immediately after, don't worry, um, it is still coming to you. Um, Colin did mention questions. Um, at the top of your screen currently, you should see a blue menu, like a little blue bar. Um, at the top of that, uh, or whenever you hover over that blue bar, that's going to show your menu. Um, you'll see on your menu you should have a questions icon. So that is where you want to ask your questions. Um, just make sure whenever you do ask a question, if you do have one, to uh, choose all panelists. If you don't choose all panelists, uh, the appropriate people won't be able to see it. So just make sure you ask your questions in the Q&A um, uh, section and then also direct it to all panelists. Uh, last thing, just on the admin list, the interactions. Uh, so sometimes our, our presenters might ask for some interactions uh, they might say, uh, give me a green check or a red X or some type of smiley or some raise your hand. Um, those interactions are actually found on the participants menu. Um, also, whenever you hover over that blue menu bar, uh, you should see the participants icon. When you click on that, at the very bottom of that pop-up, you'll see those different interactions. So there's a little gray hand, 
a green check, a red X, uh, and so on and so forth. So if they ever ask for any type of interaction during our presentation, that is what they're looking for, okay? All right, um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and give that over to Chris Burroughs to start us off. All right, thank you, Krista, and Colin and the, the Buckley team for arranging the discussion today. And of course, as uh, Colin said, thank you for uh, attending, everyone who's uh, joining us for the topic today. So we're gonna get into uh, a high-level discussion of um, it, it standards, uh, where they are today, uh, possibly a future outlook, um, as well as different types of systems and approaches to um, conditioning and, and improving indoor air quality, uh, contaminant, concentration, uh, removal, exposure potential, things like that, whether it's uh, a new construction or uh, an existing building that you might be working on. Uh, and again, like uh, Colin was saying, reach out uh, with any questions uh, of more detail, more specific applications as we uh, conclude today. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, so again, uh, we'll start with an introduction, a couple slides talking about a couple of terms, a couple of different aspects, elements that affect indoor air quality in these spaces that we'll be talking about today, mainly offices and, and education, but these do have a wider range of application. Construction type, uh, we'll get in for new construction, focus mainly on the workplace, as well as education facilities, and then uh, pass it over to uh, Mike Holliday uh, on the price team as well, and he'll, he'll talk about several uh, neat technologies that can be very easily installed in uh, new or existing buildings, um, as well as talk about um, more specifics of the, the clean air technologies. So we wanted to, to kick it off, and, and a lot of this is going to be review um, for the group here, but there's a lot of considerations that go into affecting indoor air quality, whether improving or, or decreasing the indoor air quality in the spaces. Uh, the, there's different air distribution methods, um, and ASHRAE is putting out papers talking about uh, whether it's a, a mixed system or a stratified air system, fully mixed or fully stratified system, what the impacts are and considerations are for, for those different spaces and how they compare to each other. But, but those are different air distribution methods that within the space directly impact how the contaminants, uh, heavy and light particles move throughout the space um, as compared to, say, adding on uh, filtration or adding in to the ductwork different clean air technologies, whether it be UVC or bipolar ionization those sort of things are good and supplemental uh, possible opportunities to introduce into the space, but the air distribution methods also have an additional impact that is really independent from the upstream system and uh, air changes. So when we say air changes, you know, increasing air changes is a common way to try and dilute the space further and reduce the overall exposure potential for viruses and contaminants. But when we say when we say air changes, that uh, we definitely want to understand recirculating or 100% outside air, basically how the system is designed, just because we're introducing more air changes, but keeping perhaps the same amount of outside air into the space, it's, uh, you know, depending on how we're filtering that and recirculating that back into the space, uh, you know, may either have no impact on the uh, contaminant concentration or dilution in the space, um, um, or it could have a, a really large impact and a large benefit to the space if we're, you know, fil either introducing uh, high filtration into the, uh, the recirculated air or uh, increasing the outside air as part of that increase in air changes. But of course, that's going to impact um, other things uh, upstream and downstream of the system as well. Ventilation rates, of course, you can increase <clears throat> ventilation rates if the uh, basically the, the generation or the air distribution components like the air handler or DOAS uh, rooftop unit allows for increasing the ventilation rates. And then, of course, the, the fan, depending on where we're at on the, in terms of the static in the system, system static, 
and uh, the, the fan uh, selection and kind of where that's at. If, uh, if you're near the peak of it, obviously that's not going to really create a lot of opportunities to change that on an existing building. So again, kind of going with the first point here in terms of different air distribution methods, one item that we're going to talk about a lot is zone air distribution effectiveness. So that is essentially like ventilation effectiveness where it, it's looking at how the air system designed is going to distribute the supply air uh, all the way to the occupied zone and then how it travels to the return air uh, location and extract it out of the space. Obviously, there's, there's different impacts, whether you're mixing from up above, either supplying cool air or warm air from the ceiling and what that delta T is, as well as supplying from low level, either from the floor or in the wall and pushing all everything upwards out of the space. That's going to have an impact. And then different clean air technologies, just kind of having using that catch-all term here, uh, but uh, BPI, UVC filtration, um, we'll talk about some of those items as well, mainly in a uh, mic section in the, uh, the second portion of this talk. So, you know, when we're talking new construction, obviously all of those are basically on the table as feasible options. Of course, considering things like first cost and, um, you know, feasibility for the climate and the type of, uh, you know, construction material and building type that we're, we're looking at, there's really an opportunity to introduce all of those types uh, into a new build, even if it's a portable unit or whether it's a different type of air system, um, there are several techniques um, in terms of in improving the indoor air quality in the space uh, that we'll talk about mainly in my section. And then uh, again, in retrofit, we'll talk about some real easy solutions on my section. Now, with retrofit, the one thing to, to always consider is, you know, for introducing higher MERV rating upgrading uh, units from MERV 8s to 13s or even up to HEPA, that obviously impacts directly the fan uh, as well as the static uh, that that unit is seeing. For increasing the air changes, obviously that is going to uh, impact the static of the system, could even possibly introduce having to rebalance the system if we're just bumping up the, the, air, the, uh, the fan speed and supplying more air uh, throughout the space. So, you know, then we get into questions like, uh, ductwork sizing, uh, likely size for that, um, you know, that peak design initially. And so what do we do if we have to increase it 20, 30% and, um, you know, do we have to change the duct? And, and those sort of things need to be considered up front and when we're, uh, we're changing things like that and uh, introducing uh, additional static pressure drum. So in terms of new construction, we'll talk about um, Mainly the, the two types that we wanted to mention today that we feel has a lot of potential is, is going to be creating uh, a stratified system in the space. So we'll, we'll talk about for those that have, um, have not dealt with the, that type of system before. Um, in fact, right now, if, if I could just get everybody to kind of answer uh, either with a check box, green check box, or a red X in terms of no, how many have dealt with, you know, or designed or familiar to some extent with a stratified air system? Uh, checkbox being yes, X being no. I'm starting to get some responses coming in. <clears throat> so again, if I could just have you, there we go, getting quite a few. So it looks to be about 50-50. So this will this will be good for those um, that are used to it. It'll be a, a nice uh, refresher, but uh, we'll get into some of the basics real quick here and go through that. So when comparing it, of course, to a traditional system that we're likely more used to, where you're supplying cool air from the ceiling, uh, you're essentially trying to induce the room air up towards that diffuser and, and mix it. Uh, throw it throughout the space at high velocity, higher static pressure through that uh, ceiling uh, device, that uh, diffuser or grill device. And the idea is to uniformly mix the temperature as well as the contaminants throughout the space. So the idea is that you dilute uh, rather quickly the contaminant concentration, thereby reducing, you know, the, the amount of particles the occupant would breathe and um, be witness to and essentially lower the overall exposure potential. 
The other <clears throat> type of system is a stratified air system, which could be a displacement ventilation approach or a, a underfloor air distribution system that you have the raised access for. And the idea is that you're supplying at a, a closer to room or body neutral temperature, about 10 degrees warmer than a traditional mixing system. And the idea is you're introducing directly into the breathing zone. So your fresh air goes to the breathing zone quicker, um, which, which improves its uh, effectiveness, air change effectiveness. But also you're in general throughout the space, especially around the occupied um, key load, the human load, is, is moving a lot of that air up across their body because it's all buoyancy driven. So the idea is that we're pushing uh, a lot of that, the heat load, but also some of the contaminants, especially the ones that do not fall out of suspension or lifted up out of the space. So what you end up happening is a, a larger concentration of, of contaminants above the breathing zone, improving the air quality. Uh, so this looks like it's, uh, kind of uh, lagging a little bit, but you can see here we're, we're providing a, a smoke demonstration of about 40 feet per minute nominal phase velocity on this diffuser. And we're simulating uh, three occupants here by these thermal mannequins. So what you can see is that they're the heat sources, in this case, uh, you know, occupants, are actually what's moving the air uh, throughout the space. Uh, so it's kind of uh, filling up that lower portion and then anywhere there's upward movement is, is from a heat source in the space. Uh, you also get a general upward movement kind of outside of those heat sources that pushes upwards as well. So it's a really quiet system. It's, it's again, you're not pushing through high velocity and all the momentum, momentum in the space is, is driven by the diffuser. Instead, it's really natural convection that's uh, moving the air throughout this space. So really low static pressure drop across these diffusers to, to get this done. <clears throat> so that's the kind of the uh, 30,000 foot view of it and how it operates and showing the demonstration of it. The air change effectiveness, which I mentioned earlier, is, is a little different than the zone air distribution effectiveness. Essentially what this is looking at is how quickly the supplier gets to the breathing zone compared to the time it takes for the supplier to get to the return. So it's, it's basically a ratio, if I could summarize it simply like that, looking at um, a higher air change effectiveness means that the air is getting to the breathing zone quicker than it takes to get to the return. And so you have a higher level or a higher number of ACE means that it's, um, it's improving how quickly and effective that, that air distribution system is at getting the air to the breathing zone directly. So uh, underfloor air distribution, or UFAD, can be nearly as, almost as twice as effective at delivering the fresh air as compared to a mixed system. Um, and that's just really naturally due to uh, mixing, hopefully being near, near 1.0 uh, or uniform mixing. Um, and again, the momentum required to kind of move and churn up that entire space um, takes a bit more time than a, a, a low-level supply system like UFAT or displacement. So the average was about 30% improvement over uh, overhead mixing. They had uh, localized peak uh, air change effectiveness levels um, and really, really focused on those areas where the, the heat sources are, like the occupants. That's, uh, that's one study by Young and Zeller that summarized that. The other one is, uh, <clears throat> again, ASHRAE uh, 62.1, which is the ventilation standard. Uh, so they, they allow, depending on the, if you're looking at the ventilation effectiveness approach, where you've got uh, compared to a mixing system, if everyone recalls that table, uh, I think it's 6.2, um, in the, the ASHRAE 62.1 standard, comparing a 0.8 to a 1, and what's now allowed to be up to 1.2 or even 1.5 for spaces taller than 18 feet. Uh, you can see up to a 40% either reduction in outside air, or rather what's most likely would be the case is that if you supply the same amount of outside air with UFAT as you would with an overhead mixing system, that's gonna give you a 46% improvement in the ventilation effectiveness of the system. 
So this was one study that um, we uh, we were looking at where it's an open office design. You can kind of see the, the furniture, cubicle spaces um, enclosed here. And we have round floor displacement diffusers placed all throughout uh, this open office area. And then linear floor grill diffusers supplying air at the perimeter. So you can see right at those fresh air outlets, um, a really high ventilation effect in this in the blue. The average at the breathing level for seated occupants, 42 inches above the floor. Average E sub Z, which is again ventilation effectiveness, was about 1.51 uh, throughout this entire space. Uh, so throughout the open office, you can kind of see you've got a, anywhere from 1.2 to even up in the high twos where those diffusers are located. So I just wanted to point out here that uh, in ASHRAE 62.1, the latest version, the, there's, there's a, quite a bit of changes that happened to this table, uh, 6.4, sorry about that, uh, 6.2. The traditional E sub Z was 1.2 for these systems. Uh, now there's an additional allowance for a space that has the return air located 18, 18 feet above the floor. Uh, you can use 1.5 for your ventilation effectiveness. So I guess what that means is especially atriums, lobby areas, um, spaces where you might not have a latent uh, condition driving the space or a lot of occupants in the space, there could be um, a significant reduction. So the, the one thing with 62.1 is, is that it's really driven by a minimum level of indoor air quality um, or acceptable indoor air quality. Uh, the requirements are really not based on uh, overall exposure potential. And that's, that's made pretty explicitly clear in several areas. You look at the ventilation rate tables, which is what I, I pulled from on the previous slide, looking at the stratified ventilation effectiveness rates. Um, if, you, if you look at the um, the, the other table where it's got a, an allotment for per occupant ventilation requirement as well as a per square footage, uh, you can see there's, there's notes underneath there. Um, this one was note B, kind of where the occupant health care facilities are located, where it's actually kind of explicitly calling that out, that it's, it's not really to address, these ventilation rates are not to address the transmission of airborne viruses, bacteria, or other infectious contagions. So, you know, we suspect that in the future uh, there, there could be some changes um, to, you know, increasing ventilation rates that's currently in 62.1. We'll have to see um, what the uh, the committee decides there, but um, could even get to a point where it's, it's close to ASHRAE 170, like the healthcare standard, but um, nothing uh, to say for certain at this point. But just to be aware, that's kind of the um, little bit of background info on 62.1. Uh, this next part, I'm just going to go through quickly. There's there's other things that kind of are pulled along by using this type of stratified system. Uh, lead and well building standards. So well building is really focused on the occupant and improving uh, occupant wellness. And they offer a number of, of um, sort of points towards their uh, their structure by using this type of system. And that's that's kind of all I'll, I'll say on that, as well as lead, there's other opportunities. Um, as I kind of hinted at earlier, because this is a naturally buoyancy-driven type of system, uh, you're not really pushing it high static. Um, the underfloor air system is, is really served by 0.05 inches of static underneath the floor plate. So really, really helping reduce the fan power requirement for the building by um, pushing at that low static. Less expense to cool if, you, if you're able to, especially in some climates, uh, utilize free cooling, 100% outside air, um, up to 65 degrees. In a lot of cases, that can be a huge benefit. Lower noise, so a lot of times we see it applied in concert halls, auditoriums for these reasons. Again, that low static pressure, low airspeed that's uh, used to supply these diffusers results in noise levels well below uh, NC30 and a lot of selection criteria. All right, so getting into workplace, um, you know, this this really designing and future-proofing the, the, the workplace is, 
a, a huge discussion at this point. How do we create flexible environments, um, spaces where now we shift from a completely open office with uh, a lot of eye-to-eye -eye contact to barriers, like what's shown here, um, as well as even completely enclosed spaces. You know, having an underfloor air system that is non-ducted uh, is really beneficial to increasing the flexibility to a building owner um, or developer um, or even a, a private, privately owned building um, as your business continues to change and evolve and as these standards continue to change. Um, so a lot of times we'll see uh, the underfloor air system used in a, a commercial setting in an office space um, because it provides the air directly uh, in those cubicle spaces or, or walkways and um, also creates that flexible system with that raised access floor. So here's a couple smoke videos. <clears throat> Again, this is looking a little choppy, but you'll be able to, to get the idea. This is the uh, partially mixed diffuser, the twist pattern diffuser. And so you can see this one has a bit of a turbulence to it. It's kind of inducing some of the low level air into that, into that uh, air stream. Um, but you can see it's not throwing above four and a half feet. So the idea is that we're not re-entraining heat, heat load from above the breathing zone back down into the supply. So again, to, to minimize energy uh, usage, as well as not re-entrain contaminants back down into the uh, occupied space. The other one, which again is gaining more and more uh, traction is the displacement diffuser, ground floor diffuser. So this one is really minimizing the induction uh, inducing of the room air and allowing that full stratification to take place. Here you can see very similar uh, smoke visualization compared to the in wall displacement smoke video that we just saw seen earlier. So the RAISE 4 again really creates a lot of flexibility being able to put the, the plug and play modular wiring underneath the floor. You could put your plumbing and all sorts of services under there. That way you're not digging into drywall and trying to change out you know, as USB, USB-C and, and other, um, you know, Ethernet cables, all of that continues to evolve and change, change. having that easily accessible at the floor level through uh, an access floor is, is a, a large benefit to many building owners. The, the one obstacle to overcome in the past has been first cost, and, and there's a lot of um, cases and the studies that now as this system has evolved, and not so much commoditized, but essentially gotten to the point where it's it's very cost competitive. And in some cases, there's a lot of, uh, in this case, a developer uh, has, has uh, noted a five to seven dollars per rentable square foot of savings on the mechanical equipment. Um, in some cases, if you get aggressive, you could possibly even save on on the actual overall construction cost of the building because you're you're actually saving on the interstitial space height because you're not you're not dealing with a two to three foot ceiling void anymore with a mixed air system. Instead, you're putting all the air and a lot of the services under a 12 inch tall raised access floor in a lot of cases. So if you have an exposed ceiling, that's even a, um, more additional benefits to the uh, floor to floor height. Uh, so this was one project that I uh, wanted to highlight. It was a, a headquarters in Texas where they moved from uh, had an overhead air system that they were comparing the, the first cost to an underfloor air system. So there's a number of savings that you'll see with the UFAD system. Again, it's not piped, or, or sorry, it's not ducted. All of the diffusers are, are served by a pressurized air plenum. Um, so you can see a significant amount of savings on sheet metal, uh, quicker to, to install the project uh, in some cases by reducing the on-site labor. Everything's drop in, drop in uh, play in plug and play. And then the HVAC equipment, again, had a, uh, a savings here as well. And then again, it's uh, quicker to build, less times and, and changes involved on site um, because there's there's less coordination needed um, when communicated up front properly. Um, so there was a savings on the contractor fees. So what they saw, even without modular power and the benefits there, under the floor, about a one and a buck and a half of savings per square foot on first cost. Mm -hmm. So this one, I'm going to kind of skip through uh, just because we, 
you know, when I when I show you a couple of other things. So this is to kind of show what the the underflow air system might look like. And so you've got round floor diffusers, zone distribution box that I'll just pause this here. Zone distribution box that communicate and, and transfer power uh, to the furniture, modular desks, um, you know, to outlets for the computers and the equipment, um, as well as uh, transferring Ethernet and internet throughout the um, or IP throughout the space. And so all that's plug and play. And you can see here that we've got essentially a, an open office approach. So what happens when an owner wants to go from an open office um, to a more enclosed barrier um, space, safer space approach where you've got, you know, more enclosed spaces. Um, with the UFAT system, we're going we're gonna to change this to three private offices and then a conference room as well. So what ends up happening is you can essentially move existing equipment around and, and utilize uh, existing materials. So really you just plug in the equipment to the existing control boxes here. It's kind of hard to see because it's jumping around, but you're keeping the same diffuser face and ring and just swapping out the manual basket for an automated basket for this conference room. And then everything plugs and plays into an existing controller. And then the, the walls could be, you know, floating or above floor and brought in quite easily like that. So again, that's kind of a quick view of the, the flexible nature of it. Um, Again, as in terms of the the uh, the mechanical system, and again, this is this probably warrants further discussion. But there's a couple approaches to uh, providing air out to the space. Some of which you might have some ductwork to run the air close to the, you know, within 50 feet of the perimeter. Uh, here we've got a mechanical room, local uh, centrally located, and outside air ducts uh, represented by the the orange boxes here. The other thing is going to a fan column approach. We've got a vertical air tower. So between the last slide shown here and then going to the air tower approach, you'll notice the core shrinking a little bit. So if that's possible for the project, that could be quite a bit of savings up front. And these vertical air towers essentially uh, accept the outside air and also uh, have a chilled water coil and uh, provide the conditioning and pressurize through this downward discharge into the underfloor plenum um, on a local level. So it puts all of the air injection points very close to these perimeter zones and can pretty much reduce the ductwork if not eliminate it. So the idea is that we're moving these into a small closet in the tenant space and shrinking that core. And the closets are anywhere from six by six to eight by eight. Um, it's it's not uh, uncommon to earn 200 to 300 square feet back per floor when doing this, so that can result in you know conservatively about six thousand uh, dollars per month of floor, just on estimate. So the idea here with with kind of uh, you know COVID and, and looking to the future to design for redundancy and using this type of system, you could easily envision a larger closet here where you could, you know, day two or, or year two, add another air tower directly into the space to boost the air um, and the air changes overall. So where you might day one design it for a, <clears throat> a single air tower device, it's, it's not uncommon to have two of these installed coupled together. And then you've got uh, not only two fans serving a space for redundancy, but even the opportunity to improve the air changes in the space. And again, this can all be MERV 13 filtered um, and, and different clean air technologies installed on the air tower device itself. So that's uh, that's a really good way to kind of um, have some of that. You're not you're not uh, really having to change ductwork because downstream of the the air tower, there's there's really not any ductwork um, required there for that example. All right. So next, uh, we're going to talk about education. And here we're going to focus on strictly the in-wall displacement approach. This is probably the most common type of, of installation where in a classroom you've got one or two of these diffusers 
usually in opposite corners um, to create the most uh, distribution, uh, uh, equal distribution throughout the space. And you've got this drywall chase that has the, uh, the ductwork that runs from above down to the top of the plenum. So this is a really commonly, if you design mostly in the area, um, a very common um, type of air distribu distribution approach for K through 12 in the Northeast market. So it's quite a lot of installations there. Also gymnasiums, anywhere where you need heavy duty uh, type grills, they can be reinforced and heavy gauge, you know, 14, 16 gauge with additional mullions to, uh, to take the beating uh, that you would see in a gymnasium. <clears throat> So again, you can imagine the odors, let alone um, the full scope of indoor air quality, greatly benefiting from a low to high supply single pass system. The other one is, is concert halls, auditoriums, or if you have a, a, a music center in the, uh, the school. This is probably one of the most, you know, when you look at the auditoriums designed uh, throughout the country, a lot of cases they're going with the displacement approach um, hiding the round floor diffusers underneath the seats. Every other seat is usually what's needed um, to, su to sufficiently cool the space. And then also um, underneath the seats up in these mezzanine and concert level seating locations. So displacement is not a, a brand new concept. In fact, EPA and CHIPS, which is uh, again common for the New England area, and then LEED, as well as Well Building Institute, they all directly suggest using this type of air distribution strategy. EPA, when you look at the type of HVAC system for a classroom, they suggest thermal displacement, again, because of the benefits of indoor air quality with it. Um, there's, there's a lot of studies that look at how displacement impacts um, things like CO2 levels, but also respiratory issue symptoms, flu-like symptoms. And um, these can all be provided um, upon request. Um, but these ones we wanted to talk about here. This was a classroom study in California that compared to, uh, they installed displacement diffusers. And across the hall, they had overhead mixing diffusers. And they measured the breathing zone level CO2. And they noted a 30% lower peak CO2 level in the breathing zone over a, a mixed air system. Uh, this one, the second bullet point here was a, um, a school district or several school systems that had 24 schools and they, they retrofitted 12 of them with displacement and then monitored the asthmatic symptoms, uh, you know, um, respiratory illnesses that were reported to the front office and uh, before and after the retrofit. And they noted a very significant, almost 70% reduction in the uh, symptoms reported to the front office. Uh, so again, uh, in all, just due to the, you know, again, how this system is operating, um, you can see here in this simulation um, for a school up in, uh, in the Alberta area, where they were looking at using displacement for all their schools. Um, this was showing the thermal plumes kind of operating and uh, in moving and pushing the CO2, you can see here exhausted from the students up out of the, uh, the breathing zone uh, quite effectively. <clears throat> so that's obviously going to impact, um, you know, overall uh, sicknesses and, and overall um, attendance rates by keeping the, the kids healthy, helping improve the indoor air quality in these spaces in the learning environment. Uh, I guess one thing I wanna point out um, before I kind of move into the next section and give it over to, to Mike, is that these, it's not a complicated system. Upstream of the diffuser is, is really very similar to a VAV system approach. And so the, you, you might have a VAV per classroom or a thermostat per classroom controlling the, the air volume into the space. Um, there's essentially, all we're doing is moving the location of the air supply down to the lower level and slowing it down, and that's achieving um, this, this, this stratified system. So there's there's no additional filters or wet coils um, that we're introducing into the space with this type of approach. Uh, if you think back to the smoke video, um, you know if you have one kid that just came in from gym class and now everybody's going into the the English. 
uh, studies for the next hour. Uh, that one person that has a higher metabolic rate is going to be giving off more heat to the space. Um, if you can imagine a higher heat load out from those thermal mannequins, um, say we had a more intensity of the light bulbs in those thermal mannequins, that's going to pull more air across that particular student. But it's not going to affect the, uh, the effect or the thermal plumes from the other students because they're operating based on their own heat output. This is a very flexible system. Um, it's not trying to throw from one side like what's shown here with this uh, unitary product and mix the entire space with high velocity air and really cold air. And in using fans, the idea is that, again, we want the occupants to naturally move the air throughout the space. Uh, these systems often achieve what is really hard for other uh, air distribution systems to do, um, you know, above that 90% occupant satisfaction because it's all driven by that individual level. So one thing I want to point out, just if you're working in an area with a school system that is, gets funding directly from attendance rates level, is that you could really have a direct impact on your yearly funding level. On average, we had seen about 8,000 per uh, ADA or daily attendance um, per student that was, uh, that was in the class when they, they, they uh, sort of went in and inspected. So if we can get, uh, you know, school districts converted over and using this type of system, you can imagine how even 150 students could, could uh, result in, you know, millions of, of extra dollars of funding uh, for these schools, which they could spend not on the energy bill, the utility bill, um, but, but on new bleachers or other different student programs. All right, so the last thing I want to mention, just before kicking off the mic, is that, um, you know, if you're looking at a renovation opportunity, uh, there, there is the concept of replacing a VAV box with a fan mixing box and, and converting that 55 degree supplier temperature ceiling system over to a, a warmer uh, displacement style of approach. And of course, there's all these options, we'll go through all of them, but, um, you know, different filtrations, uh, capabilities that we have with that. So definitely get in touch, uh, reach out to us if you have questions on that. Hey, Chris, so we have one question, question in the Q&A. Oh, sorry, what's that? We do have one question in the Q&A. Um, question is, is the displacement system with supply in the floor and return in the ceiling more effective than a system with supply in the ceiling and return in the floor? Yeah, so I think, you know, the that second approach very commonly used in critical spaces, obviously for flushing like an operating room uh, patient, which is which is definitely a, a very good way um, to, to handle that. Um, in terms of how you might um, achieve a upward supply low level return, at least with displacement ventilation, even if you supply displacement from uh, the ceiling, what ends up happening is you still get stratification throughout the space. And so you'll still have the warmest air up above um, the occupants and also a lot of those contaminants up in that upper zone. So if you're, if you're using, I don't know if the, the questioner is referring to a displacement ceiling supply, I would still suggest a, a high level return. Um, otherwise, if you're getting into the type of air changes and the design approach for a a system like you'd have an operating room, that would be um, something to investigate for, uh, for these types of applications. So hopefully that, that helped. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll be um, definitely around or available to chat afterwards on that. But uh, if we're all okay with, uh, I'll pass it off to Mr. Holiday. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Holiday. I'm the product manager for Air Moving Products. I just wanted to continue on the same kind of path as Chris here and talk a little bit about different ways to, to reduce airborne pathogens in the space. So with, uh, with everything that's happened in the last year, um, this has become a really hot topic is how do we reduce these type of uh, contaminants or at least lower the concentrations of them uh, in the space? So. Uh, you know, there's a couple different ways to do it. You could use filtration. You can, you know, essentially remove the contaminants from the space. Uh, you could dilute uh, the amount of contaminants in the space, or you could use something that that, that eliminates contaminants 
uh, such as UVC or bipolar ionization that we'll, that we'll get into uh, throughout the presentation. So a couple issues with trying to do this in retrofit buildings. Chris kind of mentioned it. A lot of the times, if you want to increase filtration in a space uh, with your traditional system, you know, typically we're finding that a lot of the air handlers um, can't uh, handle the increased filtration. There are cases where you can just slide it in and maybe adjust some pulleys. Uh, or tear up the VFD, but that's not always the case. You, you want to find a way to get uh, that increased filtration. The other suggestion for dilution uh, would be looking at increasing the amount of outdoor air. And we're finding that people are running into the same situation where they're not able to increase um, the amount of outdoor air because the air handlers aren't capable of uh, conditioning additional outdoor air. Um, you know, if you have those abilities to increase filtration and do that, I would strongly recommend it. It's what ASHRAE recommends is your first. Uh, your first change uh, to your air conditioning or to your HVAC system in a building. Looking into some of the other options, um, if you can't tackle it with the main air system, uh, Price has two different offerings for increasing filtration as a retrofit uh, in a space, or you can use them in new construction as well. But the first one would be the Price Room Air Purifier, uh, which is a portable uh, HEPA filtration unit that has a couple different options for ultraviolet and for bipolar ionization uh, to really help, uh, you know, prevent any of that contamination from recirculating in the space. It really has a one-pass cleaning rate for, you know, for the majority of, of viruses out there as well. And we'll get into the technologies used. Um, in the summer, over the summer, we saw both the CDC and ASHRAE recommending the use of these portable uh, high efficiency air filtration units uh, with HEPA filters. They also said uh, add some conditional, uh, some additional consideration for UVC. So we'll get into the reasons why. Um, I have uh, a little video here to to, key, uh, to kind of show you guys an intro to the room air purifier, and then we'll we'll jump into the technology. In the wake of COVID-19, it is time to start asking ourselves. Is the air I'm breathing safe? With up to 90% of our time being spent indoors, breathing high quality, fresh indoor air is critical to our health and well being. The Price Room Air Purifier uses three scientific methods to improve indoor air quality by removing suspended particles like dander, dust, smoke, viruses, and bacteria. Fresh outdoor air is filled with naturally occurring ions, which keep the air clean. Bipolar ionization technology creates indoor air quality that can rival outdoor air. Chemically charged ions introduced into these spaces combine with particles in the air, providing either a positive or negative charge. Particles of opposite polarity cluster together, making them larger and heavier, and force these particles to fall out of the breathing zone. Larger particles are also more easily captured by the HVAC filtration system. The Price Room Air Purifier comes with a HEPA high efficiency filter to capture 99.997% of suspended particles. The filter is mounted in an extruded aluminum frame to ensure filter longevity and integrity. Additionally, the Price Room Air Purifier uses ultraviolet light to provide further air disinfection. UVC is a short wave light that is naturally germicidal. The UVC light supplied for the Price Room Air Purifier has a single pass disinfection rate of up to 99%, meaning each circulation of air through the Price Room Air Purifier can rid indoor air of nearly all of its harmful pathogens. It is time to let your airflow fight to keep you healthy and to go inside to get some well-deserved fresh air. So that's a quick intro video into the uh, the RAP. I also have another video I'd like to show you guys that kind of demonstrates in a real world the effectiveness of the unit. Um, it's a it's a side by side smoke demo in one of our research lab facilities. It kind of shows you the difference between a room with a traditional overhead mixing system uh, and that mixing system with the addition of uh, the RAP in the system. So let's watch. You guys will see the the distinct difference between the two.
All right, so that kind of gives you guys a brief intro. We'll get into the, a lot of the technology used in the room air purifier. We'll talk about filtration, uh, the different types of filters and how they're not all created equal. Uh, we'll get into the uh, the UVC and the effectiveness rating in the wrap, as well as bipolar ionization. But prior to jumping to that, I just wanted to highlight another option, uh, which would be the overhead air purifier. And this is essentially a similar concept other than it would be a permanent install, uh, either, you know, it could be in an open T-bar or, or an open ceiling or in a, above a T-bar ceiling like this. Uh, that would help get uh, the equipment off the ground uh, and be more of a permanent install. So these images here are showing um, a unit that will essentially draw air in from the space, uh, filter it, clean it, uh, depending on what options you go with, and it'll put it back uh, into the interior space. And it's just a way of increasing those air changes in the space, similar to the RAP, but in a more permanent install. So getting into filtration, uh, I know this has been a big topic, um, but a couple of the basics. So the MER filters, or the minimum efficiency reporting value, um, there are two different scales, HEPA versus MERV, and MERV is essentially going to be the worst performance point for capturing filters uh, in the 0.3 to 10 microns particle size. Uh, so the filter that's used as a pre-filter in the RAP is actually a MERV-8 filter, and that's essentially used to prolong the HEPA, fil the HEPA filter life. It'll catch between 70 to 85 percent of particles in that range. Uh, so it's already a really good filter that's just used as a, a typical pre-filter, and that would be, you know, a MERV-8 would be similar to what you would have in your furnace at home for the most part, unless you've upgraded to a MERV-11. Uh, getting into HEPA filtration. You know, I noticed that uh, as the more I talk to people about HEPA filtration, it's uh, even some of the manufacturers that uh, create these portable units, I've noticed that there's not always a great understanding of what uh, what the HEPA rating is. So the HEPAs in North America are typically rated uh, to capture 99.9% .9 of particles at the 0.3 microns in diameter. And there's a common misconception uh, that that is its peak efficiency point, when that is actually its worst efficiency point. So the 0.3 Micron size actually um, is one of the more difficult uh, particles to capture. Uh, so it, the HEPA filters will actually capture smaller particles and larger particles easier. Uh, so they do rate them at a, at a minimal operating point. So that's something to keep in mind. A lot of times you'll hear people talk about how HEPA filters catch 99.9% um, .9 of particles down to 0.3 microns. But because of the different methods that are used in filtration, so the three main modes of filtration or how to capture particles are interceptions, uh, which is typically when the particles are small enough that they can pass between the fibers, uh, but they're large enough that they still, uh, when they get within radius of those particles, will get caught. So this is the at the at the most penetrating particle um, size. This is typically going to be the mechanism that's used. Uh, the other two are impaction, which is pretty straightforward. So that's when the particle is big enough that it's going to hit. Uh, the median gets stuck to the media. And the third is how the small particles are caught. And this is where a lot of people kind of get, um, you know, get lost in the weeds, but it's part, small particles don't move in straight lines. They zigzag, they, they move in a motion called Brownian motion. Uh, and these particles will actually end up hitting the filter fibers, even though they're small enough to pass through because of their erratic uh, movement. Uh, so that's uh, one of the, the, pretty much the three main ways that all filtration works. Uh, as far as physical filters. 
Another option for uh, cutting down on contaminants in the space is uh, ionization. And I'm sure you guys have been seeing a lot more of this as of late. Uh, bipolar ionization uh, works in two different ways. So the first, uh, when we're talking about um, uh, airborne pathogens, the first is going to be agglomerization, uh, which I kind of messed that up, but agglomerization or agglomeration is going to be when the particles essentially ions are created by the ionizer. It'll generate, uh, create some energy and cause uh, an oxygen module to emit an electron, and then it's going to create a positive and a negative uh, particle. And as those particles move, they're going to get um, they're going to start to attach themselves and lump together with other particles, and that just makes them, you know, easier to capture and have them potentially fall out of suspension quicker. So that's one of the methods that bipolarization ionization uses to uh, prevent the spread of airborne pathogens. The second would be um, actually killing the the viruses, and the way that it does is it'll actually, while it's creating those negative and positive ions. It'll actually rob cells, so bacteria and virus cells, robbing a hydrogen from them to equalize the, the neutrality of that uh, electron being uh, dispersed. And it'll actually destroy uh, and make it impossible for that virus to, to reproduce. A couple bonuses with bipolarization is they'll also cut down on odorous gases um, and some VOCs as well. So that's something that we've been uh, implementing in the wrap and also uh, any kind of terminal or fan coal unit could be quoted with bipolarization as well if you guys were interested in that route. So looking at uh, some of the research on bipolarization, uh, there was a, a third party study done by the Spanish government uh, looking at COVID uh, surrogates and the effectiveness of bipolarization. So essentially they, they you know, closed down a hotel and they set up rooms and they inter they introduced the, the COVID surrogates and they did a room without uh, ionization and then they did the same room with ionization. Uh, and in 10 minutes, they were able to have an airborne uh, reduction of 99% uh, in that 10 minute exposure time. Uh, the bipolar ionization, one other really key thing that you wanna look at when you're looking at ionization is the, the UL2998 rating. So that's, uh, it's actually an environmental rating and it's to ensure that the ionization technology you're using is not uh, emitting ozone. So in the past, older ionization technology did emit ozone, so they came out with these standards um, to ensure that you can get tested and certified that you don't ha uh, have an ozone-producing ionization technology. And the, the ionization used in the wrap is UL2998 certified. The third mechanism for cutting down uh, some of the pathogens uh, with these types of units, or actually in most systems, you could actually use UVC in, you know, in an air handling system as well. Um, I pulled this quote from an ASHRAE article uh, originally done in 2015, and it just says the effectiveness of a UVC system uh, to inactivate microorganisms in the indoor air or on surfaces has been aptly demonstrated over the years. So it's a tried, tested, and proven technology. Oftentimes when we're talking about UVGI, we're talking about UVC. So that's just a certain length of uh, wavelength for uh, ultraviolet light. So it's essentially the wavelengths uh, between 200 and 280 nanometers. Uh, UVC is more effective as we go higher up in the nanometers. And um, the one, the technology we're using is at 254 nanometers. A couple other key terms uh, for UV technology is the intensity. So that'll be, it's, it's the way to quantify how much energy you're getting uh, from your UV source. So it's gonna be measured in, uh, in you know, microwatts per centimeter squared typically. Uh, there are other units you can use, but that's the one you see most often in the industry. And then probably the more important one is the intensity um, or the dosage. So it's how much intensity you're getting over a certain exposure time. And that's really what's necessary to disinfect or kill um, you know, bacteria or viruses uh, either on a surface in the air. And, you know, historically, UVC was used a lot to keep coils clean in air handlers. So if you're looking at that dosage, uh, when you have a UV light sitting in front of a coil, the exposure time is essentially infinity, right? Um, so you need a smaller amount of intensity. If you want to move to a situation like inside the wrap where you don't have an infinite amount of time to kill, uh, you're going to look to kill on the fly, which means you're going to need a higher dosage. Uh, so you need more intensity over that shorter time. So in development of the wrap, uh, we worked with uh, UV manufacturers as well as our own research uh, lab, and we looked at what kind of kill rate we could get in the wrap. So 
Uh, we looked at, uh, you know, as the airflow goes down, your exposure time goes up. So your, your kill rate goes up as airflow goes down. So we're typically recommending running the wrap at 300 CFM. Uh, and if you look, the exposure time at 300 CFM is about a quarter second, a little more, and you get uh, a 99% removal of the coronavirus uh, surrogates. And as you move up to 600, you're still getting a single pass effectiveness of 88%. So the wrap itself, uh, with its uh, UVGI um, kind of canopy above the fan deck, is actually creating a, a, an amount of time and an air path uh, to affect that. And it also has a lot of reflection in there to keep the light in that cabinet, but also to increase the kill rate so that we can get these effective removal rates. Looking at sizing these room air purifiers, the biggest thing you wanna be looking at is how many air changes per hour, how many additional amounts of clean air are you getting out of the unit um, in a space? So typically, uh, depending on what kind of space you're in, you're going to start out with a minimum amount of air changes from the typical HVAC system, and you want to know how many additional ones you can add. Um, so looking at this example uh, that I have here on the on the slide here, it's a typical classroom, 30 by 30 by 10 feet tall. Um, that's going to give you a volume of 9,000 cubic feet, and at an airflow rate of 600 CFM, you take that airflow rate, multiply it by the time, and divide it by the volume, and you can get up to four air changes per hour in a typical size classroom. You know, ASHRAE is currently recommending a minimum of two additional air changes for reopening schools, uh, and as many air changes as possible should be provided. We recommend um, for a balance of acoustics and air changes running the wrap at 300 CFM uh, in a space of this size. So we do have a sizing guide that is sitting on the right here, and that'll allow you to actually uh, size up your area uh, versus airflow so you can know how many wraps you need uh, for an additional space. So that sums up uh, the presentation. I think we're going to pass it back over uh, to the Buckley representative. And uh, if you guys have any questions, we left our contact info up there. So feel free to reach out with any questions. Thanks so much, guys. Hey, yeah, if somebody can pass it over to me. I know we're running a little bit long. I apologize to everybody about that. Uh, just a few more minutes here, and then we'll get you on with the rest of your day. All right, hopefully everybody can see my screen. I don't know if somebody on the price side can let me know. Can you guys see that? Colin, we can see it. If you could just move that whatever pop-up menu you oh, have over to yeah, another screen or minimize it. All right, there you go. All right, so before we close up today, I uh, just wanted to take a few more minutes to review some of our other products that Buckley has to offer that help mitigate the spread of indoor airborne viruses and bacteria. Uh, all the Manufacturers that you see here, in, in, in addition to price, are manufacturers that Buckley exclusively represents. Um, you know, all of these companies are, are providing some sort of indoor airborne pathogen solutions. Again, just very briefly, I want to walk through some of these products and how they are being utilized to promote some healthy indoor air qualities. So th there are a lot of disinfection technologies out there right now. As we just covered, well, whether it be uh, HEPA filters, UVC, or, or ionization, and you've obviously come across all of these at some point in the past few months. Uh, Big S Fans is using their Haiku ceiling fan to provide safe in-room disinfection and, and reduce the risk of person-to-person -person transmission uh, for the entire room. So by mounting UV lights on top of the fan, uh, a UV disinfection zone is, is basically created in the upper portion of the room and then by circulating air through the disinfection zone and then delivering it back down into the space, this promote, prom, uh, helps promote a clean and, and safe space for, you know, classrooms or offices or, you know, just any general gathering area. Now, Big S Fans has this, uh, had this technology independently tested and certified in a room where they basically place several Petri dishes uh, with, with a, a COVID surrogate in different locations all around the room. Uh, 
Uh, I believe that room was around 400 square feet with uh, I think like a 10 foot high ceiling. And, and then so after running that fan for uh, 10 to 15 minutes, they found that the fan was able to kill 99.9% .9 of airborne pathogens in the room. Uh, nonetheless, a pretty powerful and, and convenient solution that they've developed over there. In addition to the Haiku fans, uh, they've also added some ionization technology to some of their fan, uh, their larger fan lines. So uh, the Air Eye, uh, uses powerful directional airflow with basically an integrated ion technology to kill the inborn pathogen. So they've mounted this ionizer right on the face of, of the air eye, um, so which that basically generates tens of thousands of ions per second without produ producing any ozone. So in this application, you know, the ions aren't being introduced into any ductwork, but, you know, rather thrown directly into the space where any of these individuals are located. The, the same technology is being used on the, the PowerFoil D large diameter HVLS fans. Uh, this time the ionizer is, is mounted directly onto the fan blade winglets. Both of these technologies are, are some of the fastest and most effective ways uh, to deliver large quantities of those charged ions into the air, you know, ensuring healthy indoor air environments. So Arius, uh, another manufacturer in the high bay applications market, has added a photohydronization cell to the center of their air pair fan line. So the air pair with the PHI cell is designed so that uh, ionized hydroperoxides are being delivered directly into the space. Uh, this helps mitigate any airborne pathogens as well as mold and spores that can grow inside the building. Uh, in, in addition to helping mitigate the airborne pathogens, those ionized particles also help improve existing mechanical filtration, as just demonstrated by the price team, uh, by making those particles stick together. So these fans are typically mounted in the higher regions of industrial large commercial spaces, such as uh, warehouses, say distribution centers, or, or even like grocery stores, or what you see here, um, you know, in a car dealership application. Depending on the size of the fan, there are two different size cells that can be integrated. So if you have an application where you think this might be a good fit, uh, please reach out and we can get you the, the help that you need in a proper selection. Powered Air has also added some UVC technology to their air curtains for a pretty simple plug and play solution. These come in full foot increments anywhere between 36 and 168 inches, so that's 13 to 14 feet, and can be run at both constant or variable speed. The unit has the ability to ramp you know, up and down to a pet potentiometer set speed, or, you know, when a door opens, or assuming it's going to be interlocked with a door switch in that application. In more complex scenarios, these can also be configured to operate based on temperature set points or air purification requirements. Either way, it's just another great easy way to add some environmental safety and, and separation for any path of, of entry or egress. And then last but not least, I'm, I'm sure most of you recognize us here at Buckley as your contact for all things green hack. So I'd be remiss not to mention them at least once today. Uh, any way you look at it, th the best way to help maintain indoor air conditions is, is to introduce more outdoor air. And there really isn't a better way to do that uh, than, than with a with a DOAS system. So green hack continues to expand their DOAS line uh, with added heating and cooling capacities. Uh, they just added the ability to you know, handle mar larger quantities of outdoor air. So we're up to 18,000 CFM. Uh, and five to 70 tons of cooling. Obviously, these come with an, en an optional uh, energy recovery wheel and, and multiple layers of filtration. We can add, you know, four inch HEPA filters into these units. Most commonly, these are, units are designed to be fully modulating in pretty much every way from variable speed compressors, uh, modulating hot gas reheat, EC condenser fans, variable speed supply fans, and, and electronic expansion valves. However, obviously there's there's many different configurations available, but anytime you're introducing large quantities of outdoor air to help promote uh, indoor air quality, that's going to be the best way to go. Now, with all that said, I hope everybody enjoyed today's webinar and and got something useful out of it. Uh, we've put together a link on our website where more information on any of these COVID-related products is organized. I think Price actually shared this too. Uh, you might have uh, access to that. Um, there you can find some more specific submittal and performance data. I'll make sure to send that link out to everybody on today's webinar so you have easy access to it. Uh, if you have any questions relative to what was discussed today 
or any of these products that Buckley represents, please feel free to reach out to your local Buckley con uh, contact. If you do not know who that contact is here at Buckley, please feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll make sure that we get you in touch with the proper individual. Uh, again, thank you to the Price team here. I appreciate everybody putting in the effort and thank you to everybody here on the line that spent some time with us today. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day.